I, I love movies. I watch movies all the time. What I hate worse is a good movie with a bad ending. Sometimes don't you get the feeling that the, the guys doing the movie just said, okay, it's time to end this movie. Let's all uh, go home. And there are some classic bad endings. Uh, a couple of my favorites. Uh, Castaway. Tom Hanks gets shipwrecked. You know, the plane crashes in the Pacific. Four years he's lost out there. What does he do? Delivers the package. One package survives. And he brings it back from the, from the Pacific and delivers this unopened FedEx package. How much did FedEx pay them to put that in there? Really? <laughs> and you're thinking, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Uh, Indiana Jones and the skull thing? Oh, come on. I'm a big Indiana Jones fan. Loved all the movies. But this is just where the guys doing the Indiana Jones movies said, we don't want to do any more of these. So Indiana Jones runs around with his glass skull, and he puts it on top of this, this headless glass alien, and these glass aliens jump up and do a disco, and a you know, uh, flying saucer comes up out of the ground, and it's like, oh, great. This makes no sense. And you want to go and, and demand your money back. You know, I sat through all this time, and I really, that's a lousy ending. I'm, I'm still mad at the Maltese Falcon. Now, some of you are old enough in here to know that great movie with, with, with Humphrey Bogart, and, he, and they're chasing this, this uh, statue that's supposedly of this gold falcon that has all of these precious jewels in it, and they get to the end, and they scrape off the black paint and realize they've all been shooting each other for a fake. And Humphrey Bogart goes, oh, well. You know, oh, well, shoot somebody, man. It's come on, it's, do something. <laughs> it's a lousy way for this movie to end. And, and so when, you, you, when you, you, you're leaving and you, and you think, gosh, that was an awful way to that movie to end. Here's, here's how that movie needs to end. Here's how you would need to change it. Uh, and then you realize you just can't change the ending, can you? You have changed the moments in front of it. You, if you want to change this, then you have to change that. And then change that, and you have to go back and change all of the other things. Uh, it's just not the ending that's bad. It's everything that has led up to the ending. We are in this part of the Easter story where we really want to change it a little bit, don't we? Uh, there's a reason that Baptists blow through Holy Week, uh, the, that week that we celebrate the last week of Jesus' ministry. And when he comes uh, into Jerusalem and, 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 and cleanses the temple and ends up being tried and then crucified, there's a reason we blow through that because we're just not comfortable with that. We, we want to get on through the resurrection and we want to we celebrate the good news that Jesus is alive, but we don't want to think about the things in between, but the resurrection just doesn't happen by itself. It's the necessary consequence, it's the necessary next step of all that's gone in front of it, like the crucifixion. And so an old prophet reminds us God had been looking forward to this moment, planning this moment when Jesus would come and Jesus would die for our sins. And he'd been giving hints of it all along the way, like the words of Zechariah, the prophet that we find next to the last book, next to the last book in the Old Testament, right in front of Malachi, is this prophet. In the 12th chapter, the 10th verse, we find this. Stand with me in honor of God's word. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. And they will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. I grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for the firstborn son. And they will see the one that they have pierced and mourn for him as they mourn for an only child. Didn't you know, Jesus asked Cleopas, how slow to believe you are, how thick. Didn't you know that Christ must first suffer? 
This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. It is hard for us to come to this moment where we, like those who were around you, look on those that we pierced. We want to look another way. We want it to be different. Teach us. Teach us the meaning and the cost and be merciful in your teaching. And we pray this in your name. Amen. The Babylonian captivity was coming to an end. There was a transition going on in Babylon and in this transition they had allowed the Jews who wanted to to return to Jerusalem. Uh, you'll remember that Babylon had overrun Jerusalem, had destroyed the city, and had taken the best and brightest back to Babylon and enculturated them into the society of Babylon. The stories of Daniel and other stories are about that transition. Now they were able to go back. Now, not all the Jews went back. A lot of them had made their lives in Babylon. They had jobs. They had careers. They had families. Uh, the kids were growing up there. So they didn't go back to Jerusalem. But a remnant did. Uh, now, this remnant believed the prophets that had been talking about when God brings the people back, that he's going to restore the nation of Israel. He's going to restore this great city of Jerusalem. And it's going to be back like it was in the time of David. And when they go back, it's not like that at all. Uh, the walls have torn down. The temple is not rebuilt. Uh, you can understand some of the devastation by some of the events of our own world, uh, like the earthquake in Haiti, uh, of how hard it is to go back and try to recreate a culture, a city, a community where everything about that community is gone. There, there are no governmental structures to hold things together. Uh, there's no religious structure to hold things together. The family unit has been destroyed and dispersed. And so trying to come back to a place and rebuild it uh, was almost impossible. And you can read some of the uh, conversations that went on in some of the other books about this, about, like the book of Nehemiah about how hard it was to get the people to understand that now they've been brought back, now God was going to restore things and it was going to be a lot of hard work. And so in their complaints, in their crying out, Zechariah, a prophet, gives this word, I will send on the city of David a spirit of grace and supplication and they will look on me the one they have pierced. God is saying to Jerusalem and to the inhabitants of that city that I am going to come and when I come I will flood the city with my grace and my presence and you will look on me, the one you have wounded. That word pierced comes up a lot in the scriptures. Do you remember when Mary took uh, Jesus to the temple for the very first time and she and Joseph were confronted by the old prophet Simeon and Simeon comes up and warns Mary, a sword will pierce your own heart as well. It was years later when they watched Jesus die that the gospel writers, like John, would write, this was done to fulfill what the prophet said, that they'll look on the one that they have pierced. That is a sobering moment, isn't it? And we can certainly understand why Cleopas and his friend were so slow to comprehend. You remember the story we've been talking about. Jesus catches up with two people as they're walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and they begin to talk about everything that is going on. And they begin to explain to Jesus, who they don't think understood anything that had happened, about who Jesus was and about what he had done and how he was a great prophet and how the, the religious leaders of the day had turned him over to the Romans and the Romans had crucified him and that we had hoped that he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped that he would indeed be the Messiah. We had hoped that things would be different. And 
And Jesus interrupts them and says, don't you know that the Christ had to suffer before he could come into his glory? Didn't you understand that? Well, yes and no. Uh, yes, we understood that, that the Messiah would come. Yes, we have been looking for the day that a Savior would come and God would send somebody to rescue us and he, he would restore Jerusalem to, to his rightful place and he would run off our enemies and we would be a people of God again. Yes, we understood that, but we did not understand it would look like this. We didn't understand that the price of our salvation would be this bloody, would be this awful. We didn't understand that it would take the death of God's own son. We didn't get that. And the reason we don't get it is because we do not take sin seriously. We don't understand what it costs. We don't understand the payment. We, we think, well, it's just to be human to mess up. Or, or it doesn't matter. Or Jesus will forgive me no matter what I do. And we make light of his, uh, of his death. And we treat it as if, uh, as if it is of little consequence. And you will hear people all the time go, well, I'm, well, okay, you messed up, no big deal. It doesn't matter. And you and I know that that is not true. It does matter. And sometimes you and I have been in situations where we have been wrong, where we've done wrong, where we have messed up. And we've gone to talk to the person that we hurt or wounded. And the person will say to us, it's okay, it doesn't matter. And you know that's not true. It does matter. Our world tells us all kinds of lies. And it will tell us that, hey, it doesn't matter. There are no consequences. You'll be fine. And you're not. Over and over again, we are reminded in Scripture that sin has an awful cost. In the first chapter of his book, James reminds the early church that sin always leads to death. When you are tempted, James writes, don't say that you're tempted by God, for God is not tempted, nor does he tempt. But here's how sin happens. Sin happens when you conceive the thought in your mind. The thought then becomes your desire. It becomes what you want. When it becomes the desire, the desire gives birth to action. You act on your desire. That action is sin, and sin always brings death. Always. No exceptions. Nobody. Nowhere. No time. Every time. Paul tells the Romans in chapter 6 that the wages of sin is death. That when you sin, the currency you're paid back with is death. Now, it's not always a stomping of your heart, but it's always death. A friend confronts you unexpectedly, and you know if you tell the truth, you're going to get in trouble. So it's not that you lie not a big lie big lies are wrong little lies are helpful <laughs> so you may not lie you just don't tell the whole truth you may not lie you just kind of buy yourself some time so you can think of a better way to tell your friend the truth that you know is going to cause you some kind of problem or going to hurt your friend some way. So you don't tell the truth and then something dies, doesn't it? When your friend figures out what's happened, that you misled them, that you were not honest with them, something dies, doesn't it? And integrity dies. Trust dies. A friendship is wounded. And it's never quite the same after that, is it? Something dies every time. The world will tell you, ah, that doesn't matter. It does matter. You matter. The world tells our kids, did you see all the stuff in the paper this past week about our hookup culture? And colleges young young adults and how our world actually encourages this kind of behavior among young adults it doesn't matter they say it does matter because we the world doesn't tell our young adults it doesn't tell us that sex is a beautiful language given by God to a man and to a woman 
in the confines and the safety and security of a committed marriage to each other. This is the way a husband tells a wife and a wife tells a husband, I love you as I love no other. And this language is so intense and so intimate that souls touch. Now, if you're in the beauty of a confined marriage, those souls touch and they bond and they stay together. But if you're not, those souls touch and they bond and then you pull apart. And when you pull apart, you tear and wound the soul itself. And it bleeds and it heals, but it scars. And scars can't feel. And before they know it, our young people are devastated by souls that have become so scarred that they don't know how to recognize authentic love. Don't tell me it doesn't matter. We seem shocked at the consequences of our behavior. A young executive, an ambitious young woman wants to get ahead. Well, you know the economy, the numbers aren't what we want to do, so she fudges just a little bit. No big deal, just give her a little more time and then the numbers are exposed and her career explodes. It does matter. Death comes every time a husband has an affair. He realizes his mistake, confesses to his wife, apologizes, repents, she forgives. They try to work it out, and it, it's never quite the same anymore. Something has died. It does matter. It's a hard reality, isn't it? To stand in front of Jesus on the cross and watch his life drip away and realize that it is my fault he is there. To realize as he exhales for the last time that his death is your fault. Was it for crimes that I have done? That he groaned upon the tree. Yes. Yes. It's our fault. Not the Romans. Not the religious leaders of the day. Our fault. It's hard to realize. Hard to admit, isn't it? that this is where sin takes you. And if the story ended on Good Friday, that would be a hard, hard moment. We wouldn't have any hope. No way to get better. No way to fix it. I was talking to a young friend of mine at a local coffee shop. He did not grow up in the church, did not grow up in a Christian home. So he tells me, he said, you've got to start from the beginning. So we, we spent a long time talking about, uh, about the story of Jesus and uh, about what the gospel means and what that means to be in relationship to Jesus. And, and I grab a pen and I, there's, a, there's a napkin on, on the table there and I draw a horizontal line. I said, I want you to look at this line. I said, this line is justice. It's a horizontal line. This is the line where God says, this is the line you do not cross. This par, but no further. God is a holy God. God is a just God. It's not that God goes by the rules. It is who he is. Justice is who he is. If there's a wrong, he can't tolerate it. If there's anything less than holy, anything less than just, it cannot survive in the presence of God. Do you understand that? His holiness is so intense so ferocious, it literally consumes anything that is not. Now, if that's the story, this is the line. Now, we have crossed that line. We're on the other side of that line. We have broken the laws of God. We have broken the rules. We have refused a relationship with him. Now, you can tell the story of Adam and Eve. You can tell your own story. It always ends up at the same place. We're on the wrong side of the line. 
and we can't fix it. So, God has the option. He can condemn us all. That would be justice. But that's not all God is. God is also mercy. So I drew a vertical line. And I said, this is the part of God that won't let us go. And so God comes into our world himself. How else does he solve this problem? He comes himself. The only one who is without sin, the only one who is perfect, the only one who doesn't know what it is to fail or to break the law of God, God came himself to us. Remember, the gospel is not that you can get to God. The gospel is that God has come to us. Now, mercy wants to redeem. Mercy wants to bring back. Mercy wants to pull in and, and, and make things better. But you and I understand that, that that can't be done unless you take justice seriously. Uh, and, and it's hard in our world to take justice seriously. And, there, and there's a, there a new book out now about, about hell and, and, and what happens after you die. And, and everybody's blogging about it and everybody's writing about it. I haven't read the book yet. Uh, may not. I may just read everybody's blog about it and just stay with that. Uh, but the issue is, is, is whether or not there's hell and what happens in hell and are you forever s separated from God and that kind of stuff. That's not what we're scared about, is it? Uh, have you ever visited a prison? People in prison know why they're in prison. And they'll tell you. Why, why are you here? What did you do? I shot a guy. I stole cars. I robbed this. I did. They know why they're there. And if you wake up and you are, <laughs> you are separated from God for as far as you can see, you will know why you were there because you've chosen. That's not what concerns us. That's what frightens us. What frightens us is that we'll wake up and realize that God doesn't care. It doesn't matter to God. See, at least Hale says that God cares. If there's a symbol of justice, something's going to be made right. So mercy comes and intersects with justice. And I drew the cross. And I said the intersection of God's love and God's mercy with God's justice is where these elements fuse in such intense passion and love that they form grace. Do you know that you are made up of things that only come from exploding stars? Did you know that? There are elements in your body that are only made in exploding stars. When um, uh, supernovas blow up, they shoot out into the galaxy the foundational elements that we need for life as we know it. It only comes from stars. The intense heat of that explosion fuses new elements. The intense heat of God's love and his justice and his mercy fuses grace for you. Can't fix it, no. Jesus fixes it. And God looks at you and me now through this fusion of grace as if he looks on Jesus himself. That's the story. Didn't you know that? Did you know that the Christ had to suffer for sinners like you and me? One of my favorite hymns is written by Isaac Watts called When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. You know what's historically interesting about this hymn is that it was written, it's one of the first ones written to use the word I. You know the last verse? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. Standing in the presence of the Christ who's dying for you demands one response and only one response. All of you. Didn't you know? 